As part of the training as a very junior doctors, the workload during the younger days is actually quite different. You need to complete the entire processes. And a lot of times the workload will not allow the very young doctors to have much deeper thinking about life and death because there's so much of the work that the young individuals need to handle. It is very hard for me now to recall my very first death encounter as a practicing junior doctor. It is just hard because Workloads being piling up, so it's not that easy for us to truly have all these close reflections. Possibly much later in my life, when I lost my mother, uh, that was when I was already in a very senior position as a medical doctor. She went through a period of palliative care uh, before she passed on. And personally, I am very, very grateful and fully understand the meanings of palliative care and also the dedications of the hospice care people, how they managed to handle my mom's situations and also walk her through the last journey of her life. Infectious disease clinicians, that is actually very different because for infectious diseases, it tends to be acute and it tends to be manageable and treatable. And our task is to make sure that we treat the individuals, treat the acute episodes of infectious conditions and make sure that they recover. So it's a very, very different types of medical practices, very different journeys. I think the hardest is still death during pandemic, especially conditions that is highly hazardous or highly dangerous, that we don't even allow family members to come into contact. I would say that those kind of deaths are the most lonely death. And the families will have to go through a long period of pain. For the fact that many of these highly infectious patients being put in isolations, we don't allow family members to have physical contacts with them. They can only view them at a distance, perhaps through a glass panel. And when they pass on, they are basically on their own. The family members will not have a chance to be with them during their last moment. And the kind of pain, I believe, is going to be a lifelong scar to the family members. Certainly, this kind of death, especially this kind of relatively short, unexpected or traumatic death, the impact will be much more, not only on the patients and on the family members, but on the medical team as well. I've seen many of my social workers who held the hands of the family members, helping them to cope with the immediate impact of the demise of their loved one, and helping them to cope with what we call last office. In other words, a lot of preparations in terms of the funeral. And they basically become the bridge between the patients and the doctors and the families. When I started out as a medical doctor, basically this, those days we call it houseman and then you know, junior medical officer, the workloads keep piling up. In other words, there is a little time to really reflect on life and death. And one of the things that we had to do as a junior medical officer was to start preparing our patients to be assessed and score by a team of senior doctors to see whether they will be eligible to get assistance for them to gain into further treatment. The slot that we can provide for them to go through this life-saving treatment were limited at that point in time. And therefore, we may have 100 patients and you may have to score them so that only the top 30 or top 50 can gain into this kind of community assistance for them to gain treatment and, of course, be able to sustain their life. Now, those were difficult moments because as a junior doctors, we have to now start scoring our patients and present the case so that 
they can gain a little bit of the advantage to be in that list, in, to be selected. So I still remember that I had one patient, a divorcee, with a young daughter. I really wanted to help her to get into the system. Unfortunately, she just falls short of one or two points, and therefore the cut-off line cut her off from the assistance. She came back multiple times into the hospital, having fluid overload. She just can't, cannot get rid of the water because of the kidney failure. And of course, she accumulated a lot of toxic substances, and it was because of the failure of her kidney function. And uh, we began to be a little bit upset with her. You know, why, you know, you keep coming back, can't you take care of yourself? But it's only on deeper questioning then you realise the reason why she kept coming back to be hospitalised because she was basically rationing the very limited resources that she had at a point in time. So she went through this, what we call uh, peritoneal dialysis. There is bags of fluids that they need to infuse into their peritoneal cavities and that toxic substances and water are being washed out using that kind of methods. And instead of having four bags for her to do the dialysis, she used only one bag. Very easy to understand why, because she just do not have the financial ability for her to go through four bags a day. And that's the reason why she kept coming back into the hospital with a lot of toxic effect from renal failure. It was very sad because she was doing that because of financial limitations. And also she basically is grasping the last straw to stay alive as long as she can for her daughter. Was very young at that point. I left the posting and I knew about her demise only after I left that posting. You know, I, I can't fix the system at that point in time. I'm a, just a very junior medical officer, but I am very, very glad to see the community set up, the voluntary welfare organisations set up uh, to provide more of the care to the uh, renal patients. And I'm also very glad that today we really do not need to go through that kind of burdens because the provisions of care will be there for people with renal failure in Singapore. And that's something that I'm very glad that over the years uh, the system has improved so much to be able to take care of every Singaporean. I look at it from both sides. One would be from acute infections and one would be from a chronic infections. For acute infections, we will do our utter best to make sure that we can save and bring our patient back that don't happen all the time. So to an acute episode that we think is something that we want to get all the resources and whatever we can to bring the patient back, and if we fail, yes, it is perceived as a failure, or we take it as a failure because we fail to bring the patient back from an acute conditions. And I think the important thing here is to be able to learn from every case if we fail to do that, is there a reason why? Is it something that we can do so that we can avoid the similar situations again and do a better job the next time? Now, when you come to chronic conditions, it's actually very different. I have one patient who had HIV infections and he was well suppressed and well recovered. He regained his health through treatment. And subsequently, he developed cancer of his gut. We went through a very long period of discussions, but he was very insistent to not take up any treatment for his cancer. He would continue his HIV treatment, but he adamantly refused the treatment for his cancer which to me at that point was treatable. It was a curable, treatable cancer condition. And the reason why he refused was very simple. And it's what he shared with me. 
I want to die with cancer and have my death certificates indicate that I die of cancer. I want my family to tell the rest of the other family members that I die of cancer and not HIV. And that's a stigma that many of my patients face with HIV conditions. And indeed, he just simply refused, despite our multiple discussions. And he passed on about two years later, after his uh, diagnosis. I think uh, to anyone who understands HIV, well, <laughs> I think it's, it's difficult to, to really describe, uh, but I told him that I respect his decision. Although as a doctor, uh, I fail to convince him that you know, he has very good chance of curing his cancer conditions and his HIV was very well controlled uh, at that point in time. Uh, but his personal decisions and these decisions is basically based on how he perceived that the disease was so badly stigma and also he wants to preserve the dignity for himself and also for his family. I would say empathy is, is necessary. We are all humans, we have feelings. We have feelings for people around us. We have feelings when we look at the situations. But at the same time, we also have to balance and not let emotions overwhelm the things that we need to do. When I took up infectious disease as my subspecialties and I went overseas for my postings to study. Um, in that posting overseas, I came across many of the HIV positive individuals and I learned a lot of skills, I must say, managing HIV positive uh, individuals. So after my returns from my overseas training, and I look at the local system, I realized that, in fact, there are a lot of things that we need to do for the HIV positive population. So for that, I decided to take up HIV medicines as my sub-sub-specialty, so to speak. And it was a very difficult task because those were what we call the dark day of HIV medicine. There was very limited treatment uh, and patient dies. Their life expectancy cut short significantly. Then when I look at our own HIV positive population in Singapore at the point in time, Many of them were very young individuals, and many of them were well-educated. During the period of HIV treatment, there was no subsidy provided to HIV care, and obviously the medication at the point were extremely, extremely expensive. But HIV disease is not just about HIV virus, because the virus will erode the immune system, and the body become very susceptible to many different forms of infection. And these infections, I must say, is, it was very difficult to treat during the earlier days, also because of limited medication. I mean, the breakthrough was in the year 1996, when one of the very powerful class of medication became available. And that was really, really a big challenge because the questions we have to ask ourselves was, who can access this very expensive medication? If they cannot access these medications, what will be the outcome of the disease? We all know patients will suffer for a period of time be before they pass on. And for those people that can access the medications, they live. So it is the decisions of the individuals and also the healthcare providers to decide on who live or die. So here again, I had to use my prior knowledge of a scoring system to score who we will provide with the HIV medicines, with the subsidy, who we will not. It was my second time where I have to encounter this kind of very painful situations, but it was absolutely necessary because in our mind, if we can help one, if we can help one life, it's better than completely nothing. Progressively, the entire HIV treatments journey changed significantly. 
So today I would say that anyone who needs HIV medications, need treatment, is there, is provided for, is what we call universal access. So those were the days that uh, I basically had uh, two times of my lifetime battling with something that is available that can help patients to sustain their life. And if I were to use that and look at today in pandemic management, COVID-19, for instance, it will be a very painful topic if the Singapore doctors would have to do the same thing again with very limited resources, especially for critical care. Who would go to intensive care? Who would be denied of intensive care? Because of resource limitations, that would be again a very, very painful decision and a heavy burden on the healthcare workers. I am very fortunate that for the COVID-19, we have not gone there. Every of our patients with COVID-19 that require intensive care, the care and service are there to provide for them.